You may have noticed kind of a, a juxtaposition between the responsive reading and the song from the offertory. In the responsive reading, Frederick Douglass talked about agitation, thunder and lightning, struggle, making of demands, and luminescence sang those beautiful song, beautiful song about happiness, gladness, gratitude, and that commitment to be a little bit kinder. Frederick Douglass's words were, were forceful, and the singers sang a message that was gentle. And I want you to know that this text, this tension, this juxtaposition was intentional, and that my sermon this morning, my sermon largely rests at that intersection, that intersection between this, this tension. I want to begin my message this morning by introducing to you a concept from psychology. It's a concept that was first introduced to me by a former parishioner of mine who was an accomplished professor of psychology, and one of his areas of research focused on what he called charitable attributions. Charitable attributions. And let me see if I can explain this concept to you. So I want you to picture yourself driving in a car. You're driving, and then out of the blue, someone quickly pulls out in front of you, cutting you off. Has that ever happened to anybody? Yeah. Now, in our mind, in our mind, we will want to attribute, attribute this behavior to something, to offer some reason that the driver of that car pulled out in front of us. Now, we don't know the real reason. So that means we get to make up a reason. We get to invent one in our minds. And the reason, the attribution we can make up can be either charitable or, or uncharitable. A charitable reason might be, I bet this person is having a stressful morning, having to drop a child off at school and, and is feeling really rushed to make it to work. Oh, I've been there. A charitable reason might be, I bet this person is rushing home to take care of a sick family member. We don't know if these stories are true, but they elicit sympathy and understanding. They are charitable things to think. Of course, it's just as possible for us to make an uncharitable attribution. That driver, that driver is a self-centered jerk who believes they're more important than anybody else. Or even, that driver saw me and decided to cut me off to spite me. It's the type of thinking that can lead to road rage, right? And the point of this, the point of this is that we human beings walk around each and every day making attributions to explain the behaviors we see all around us and also to explain our own behaviors. And we can approach each other in charitable or uncharitable ways. The student who approaches us at the last moment to ask for an extension on a term paper, we can approach that student with charity, believing that the student had encountered difficult circumstances worthy of our mercy. Or we can approach the student uncharitably, attributing the request for an extension to a lack of motivation or, or even a basic unfitness as a student. And if we think about it, we make these attributions, charitable or uncharitable, all the time with our family members, with our neighbors, with those we do business with, with those we volunteer with, with those we go to church with, and with those we share this small and imperiled planet with. That professor, Tom Kreshock, who taught me about charitable attributions, talks about what happens to us, what happens to us as we become more charitable in how we regard others. And let me quote him. He said, we are called to that kind of charitable response by our spiritual heritage. As a spiritual discipline, I open myself up to such a relationship in part because I have experienced it firsthand from people in my life and from people in religious community. 
I've been loved by others and I am hooked once I've experienced unconditional acceptance, understood that I will be loved no matter what I do. Once I have truly experienced this kind of love and been forgiven, then the best of me is called from within. I will become capable of loving as I have been loved. Those are beautiful words, right? I want to hold this out as a true and worthy goal. This should be how we endeavor to walk in the world, with a commitment to compassion, to forgiveness, and kindness. This is how we should endeavor to walk in the world, with a commitment to transformative relationships and shared covenant. Doesn't that sound pretty nice? Well, then there is the reality with which we are faced. My sermon this morning deals with the subject of civility. Civility is a difficult word to define precisely. Civility on on its surface has to do with politeness, manners, and tact. That's the dictionary definition of civility. But I believe it is really deeper Civility is really deeper and more substantive than that. Civility is, at its core, a matter of character. It's a matter of decency, honor, honesty, humility, fairness, trust, and ethics. The opposite of civility is incivility. It is barbarity. It is the difference between that charitable attribution which leads to some sense of understanding and that uncharitable one, which can lead us to deciding to drive that other driver off the road. The poet Simborska puts it this way, on this third planet from the sun, of all the signs of bestiality, a clear conscience is number one. And so I would add that part of being an awake and aware human being in the modern world is having an understanding that so-called civilized societies have basically always failed to live up to the challenging demands of civility. The so-called civilized nations of Europe became wealthy through colonialism and slavery. Our own nation became prosperous on the backs of African slaves and through the genocide and forced displacement of native peoples, and also through the pitting of poor people against each other and getting them to fight among themselves instead of for their common interests. You can read in our history about missionaries sent and government programs created to civilize the Indians. Now our government tear gasses them, shoots water cannons at them, deploys its military against them at Standing Rock. Which is more civilized? Clean drinking water and a livable planet or oil profits and pollution? Which is civilized and which is barbarity? You're going to have to pardon me because what I've been reading lately the books I've been choosing have been pretty dismal and depressing. I've been reading Nancy Eisenberg's book, White Trash, a 400-year social history of the white underclass in America. I've been reading Sherman Alexie's brilliant but heartbreaking short stories set on the Spokane Indian Reservation. And I've been reading Viktor Frankl's story of surviving the concentration camps. And what these books, what these books have been reminding me of is the omnipresence of suffering through human history. But these books have also been reminding me of the power of resilience that lies within the human spirit and between us through the bonds of love. This makes our present situation no less tragic, but it does make it a whole lot less lonely. So when I talk uh, this morning about the end of civility, it may be a good idea to remember that we may not have ever been all that civilized to begin with. And with that caveat, it does seem 
like we have entered, are entering a period in which a lot of the civility we may have once had is being threatened and eroded. The Southern Poverty Law Center reports that, there have, that they have been made aware of more than 700 incidents of hateful harassment and hate crimes in just the past two and a half weeks. These incidents have included the targeting of blacks and Latinos, Muslims and Jews, women and LGBT individuals. These hate crimes have included assault, stalking, vandalism, slurs, even death threats. Last weekend, neo-Nazis gathered openly in Washington, D.C. for a national conference. They openly raised their arms in Nazi salutes, shouted Nazi slogans, and called for racial and religious separatism. The hate crimes and white supremacism we are witnessing are emboldened by our politics. They are simply rising to the level of incivility and barbarity inspired by Trump's hateful, racist, misogynist, intolerant, and bigoted example. So here's the question. If our spiritual health is linked to practices of kindness, compassion, and understanding, what are we to do when the world does not play by those values, when the world openly mocks those values? What are we to do? I believe the first thing we need to do, the first thing we need to do is remember what civility is and what civility is not. Civility is not a matter of politeness, manners, and tact. The British governors of India may have dressed in suits and taken tea in the afternoon, but they were not civilized. Nazis went to the opera. That didn't make them civilized. And in fact, the, the, the people who put their bodies on the line in the civil rights movement, the civil, civil rights movement, who marched in the streets and boycotted buses and sat in at restaurants, they were accused of participating in uncivil behavior. But we know, we know what was really uncivil segregation and hate. Because what makes us civilized is decency and fairness and ethics and honesty. Civility is fundamentally an issue of character. As Barbara Kingsolver wrote in a recent powerful editorial, many millions of Americans are starting to grasp that we can't politely stand by watching families, lands, and liberties get slashed beyond repair. But it's a stretch for many of us to identify ourselves as angry opposition, she writes. We're the type to write letters to Congress, maybe, but can't see how marching in the streets really changes anything. Strikes and work stoppages won us great deals historically, but now we think of them as chaotic outbursts that trouble foreign countries. Our disagreements are polite, but politeness is no substitute for morality and won't save us in the end. We only get to decide who we are. Barbara Kingsolver continues, It may feel rude, unprofessional, and risky to break the habit of respecting our government. We never wanted to be enemies of the state. But when that animosity mounts against us, everything we do becomes political. Speaking up or not speaking up, either one will have difficult consequences. That's the choice we get. First, we need to remember that civility is not politeness. Civility is a matter of moral character. First, we need to remember that civility is not politeness. But second, we need to start practicing some more civility among ourselves. Those charitable attributions I talked about at the beginning of this sermon, remember way back then? We need to model those and we need to practice those among ourselves. We need to become proficient at this. And we need to begin by extending this charity to one another first. 
because the truth is that liberals have not tended to be disciplined at treating other liberals with compassion. I think back to a few days following the election, some liberals began to call for the wearing of safety pins as a sign that you're a safe ally. And other liberals disagreed. They said that that's a silly thing to do. And so for about a day or two, liberals began infighting with each other about safety pins. Began fighting with each other about safety pins. These are fake fights. They're counterproductive. They're destructive. We need to practice solidarity and kindness and charity and civility among ourselves. Barbara Kingsolver again. Our task is to stop shaming ourselves and claim our agenda. And so there's a lot of stuff happening. There's, you know, recounts and, and electoral college stuff and, and giving to the ACLU and giving to Planned Parenthood and, and marching in the streets and blocking traffic. But if we start attacking each other, we defeat ourselves. If we start attacking each other, we defeat ourselves. As for me, I will be out in the streets tomorrow afternoon in Raleigh with the Reverend William Barber, gathering at 5 o'clock for a program starts at 5.30 in downtown Raleigh. I'll be out on the streets next Saturday for the major, Raleigh, for the major rally in Raleigh. Raleigh in rally. I'll be out in the streets to counter the KKK when they march. I'll be in Washington, D.C. on January 21st. I hope you will join me. I hope you'll join me. That's what I'm doing. That's part of what I'm doing. And if you don't think that's the right thing to do, then I ask you to attribute that with some charitable attribution. Look at what's going on right now in South Korea right now. Hundreds of thousands of people in the street standing for civility instead of corruption and abuse. And it may just work there. And it may just work here. So when I go, when I go, I will go with my deepest moral values. I'll be keeping in mind what Confucius taught. Do not impose on others what you would not wish for yourself. I'll be keeping in mind what Rabbi Hillel taught. What is hateful to you, do not do to others. I'll be keeping in mind the counsel of the Buddha, who instructed his followers to learn to live without hate, even among the hateful, without greed, even among the greedy. So while I promise to bring my deepest morals, I'm not sure that I will always bring my politeness. Because the kind of civility we're called to manifest is not about politeness, but is about character. It is about character. Amen.